In this video, we're going to be learning about the ancestral narratives, which is the section of Genesis that follows the primeval history. So the primeval history, what I covered in my last video, was Genesis 1 through 11. The primeval his or the uh, ancestral narratives are Genesis 12 through 50. So this is a lot much longer section, um, and we're not so we're not going to go in through it as uh, in a lot of detail. I'm going to kind of hit the high points and talk about it synthetically, what the big picture story is. So you do not need to know every detail about um, all of these stories. And even in the reading, uh, you're not reading all of it. You're reading selected portions of it, uh, although a good a good chunk of it. So, But uh, I'm not going to recount all of that. So I'm going to assume that you have done the reading or that you are about to do the reading uh, for this section, so you're going, you're kind of on your own. You're, you're going to have to, um, you're going to be kind of held accountable for doing that reading because I can't tell all of these stories. That would, for one thing, that'd be really boring and long. But these uh, these stories are uh, they're about how Israel uh, began. So if we if we were to think about Genesis as a book of origins, right? And we talked in uh, in the primeval history about three different origins. The origins of the cosmos, the origins of humanity, and the origins of civilization. Now we've got a fourth origin, and that is the origin of Israel. So the covenant people, uh, the, the chosen people, who are going to be the focus of the rest of the Old Testament. So the PowerPoint titles this, God Makes a Choice. This is uh, the concept of election. God chooses one person, Abram, whom we met at the end of the primeval history. Uh, and he is, it's his descendants are going to be the Israelites. So God chooses Abram for no real apparent reason. There's, there's nothing in the Bible about Abram being better than anyone else. Um, he is chosen simply by God's own uh, free will. God chooses him. So, uh, a few words about the nature of these stories. That you'll notice that I call them the ancestral narratives, plural, because these are not a single story. There is a common theme. There's a thread that binds them together, and that is the covenant. But by and large, these stories are independent of one another. Um, they're, they're episodic in nature. If you were to think of like, you know, a TV series and you've got each episode kind of stands alone, you know, they air on their own. I mean, there may be a, you know, continued, you know, continuation. There's maybe an, an overarching storyline. And certainly there is here in the ancestral narratives, but at the same time, each story stands on its own. So I, I understand these stories as local traditions. And maybe you have been, if you've ever gone on a vacation where you uh, you go on a tour. So I've, I've done this several times. You know, I, I went to uh, England a few years ago and uh, we took one day and did a bus tour where we went to uh, Stonehenge and we went to Salisbury Cathedral and we went to Bath and uh, as we're on the bus, you know, traveling from these places, we of course have a tour guide standing up there and explaining the significance of everything we'd see. So he'd point to this building and say, oh, here's why this building is important. Um, that's kind of what we have here in, in the ancestral narratives as local traditions. They are tied oftentimes to specific locations. So something happens at a particular site. For example, uh, in uh, Genesis 28, uh, Jacob goes from, he's, he's traveling, and he stops off for the night in a little town, and uh, he goes to sleep, and he lays his head on a rock, uses it as a pillow, which doesn't seem very comfortable to me, but uh, he goes to sleep, and he has a dream, and in this dream, he sees a ladder going from heaven to earth, and there are angels going up and down on it. And God speaks to him in this dream and uh, says that uh, you know, he will be with him, he will bless him, he will make him into a great nation. And when Jacob wakes up, 
he takes this rock that he had his head lying on and he anoints it. He pours oil on it and he builds it into an altar and he proclaims the name of this place henceforth will be Bethel. Bethel in Hebrew means house of God. And it's called that now because he had this dream there and he saw the ladder. And so the idea is that, well, clearly this is a holy place. This is uh, the house of God because God spoke to me here and I saw these angels going up and down. So God must live here. So you could imagine that later on when Bethel actually is a city, how do the, the locals explain the significance of their city? What stories would they tell to a visitor? They would take them to this rock that Jacob set up, and they would tell this story and say, this is why this city is called Bethel, the house of God. Where does that name come from? And we see this kind of stuff over and over again in the ancestral narratives, that every time something significant happens, God appears to someone um, or... or uh, something important happens, they build an altar and they give that place a name. And these uh, place names are later cities in Israel, and these stories seem to have the original function of explaining why that is an important place. This is, this is called form criticism. Form criticism is uh, attempting to go back behind the texts behind the the book and understand what the role of the original oral traditions oral meaning spoken by mouth these stories were told before they were written down what their function was and for many of these ancestral narratives it seems like that function was to legitimate a worship site to explain why this is an important place why it's a holy place and why you should come and offer your sacrifices at our altar one other thing that we notice with the ancestral narratives is that each of the ancestors, and there are four of them, really three, but then the fourth one uh, kind of stands apart, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then we'll kind of tack on there Joseph, who's a little different from the others, but we'll include him. Each of them have their stories concentrated in a different geographical area. Now, they're all in Israel, but Abraham or Abram, his name originally is Abram, it's changed to Abraham. His stories are all located, they're clustered uh, in the, uh, the hill country of Judea, the areas around Jerusalem and Hebron, uh, and that area It's just sort of uh, just west of the Dead Sea. That's where his stories are concentrated. So it seems like if these are local traditions that, uh, you know, his stories, his traditions were preserved in those areas. And, and because they're tied to those areas. So people would remember, think people sitting around a campfire telling stories. That's where these would come from. Isaac, his son, his stories are concentrated even further south in what's called the Negev. This is a desert area. Uh, and in particular around a, a city called Beersheba. So he is said to have founded that city. Jacob, on the other hand, Abram's grandson, his stories are primarily concerned with uh, further north, uh, the, the central hills, uh, what is later called Samaria, and the region around Shechem. Um, and lo and behold, later on, when uh, in the period of the kingdoms, there's a split. The northern tribes of Israel and the southern tribes split. And the northern tribes are called Israel. Israel is another name for Jacob. His name is changed from Jacob to Israel. And they retain that name presumably because they had a stronger sense of kinship. They had stronger ties. They identified more with Jacob, a.k.a. Israel, than those southern areas did, and so his stories are concentrated in those northern areas. Finally, Joseph, 
his story is different altogether. Uh, he, he, it primarily takes place in Egypt, and uh, so we'll talk about him at the end. But uh, these stories are important, again, as local traditions. Um, they are also what we would call eponymous ancestors, uh, in particular Jacob and his children. So as I mentioned, Jacob's name will be changed to Israel, and that becomes the name of the nation that is founded uh, from his descendants. But each he's got 12 sons. He's also got a daughter, but she gets left out. Um, but his 12 sons, each of them has one of the 12 tribes named after them. So he's got a son named Levi. The tribe of Levi is his descendants. He's got a son named uh, Judah. The tribe of Judah is descended from him. So they are eponymous. Eponymous means the group derives their names from these ancestors. And uh, chronologically speaking here, we're, the implied era of the ancestors or the patriarchs is uh, between about 2000 and 1500, 1550 or so BC, um, or what we would call the uh, middle and uh, uh, the, the middle and late Bronze Age uh, is what that area would be, that era would be called by archaeologists. Uh, and that's so that's roughly when we're dealing with here. Now, we're going to talk first about Abraham. Abraham is a very important figure in uh, world religions, not only in Christianity. He is viewed as the progenitor, the father of faith for three world religions, uh, for Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. All, in some ways, trace themselves back to Abraham. So he's a very, very important person. And we met him, of course, actually in the primeval history, in Genesis 11, his genealogy at the end, where he is called out of, uh, out of, uh, well, initially out of Ur. His father is alive then, but he picks up that mantle later on. So he's called out of Mesopotamia, Ur being in what is today Kuwait, and he journeys first with his father to Haran, which is on the border between Iraq and Syria, on the Euphrates River. And then uh, when his father dies, God instructs him to continue on, and he will eventually will go to the land of Canaan, which is today Israel. Um, and he does this simply based on a promise for, and a command from God. So in Genesis 12, the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and from your father's house to the land that I will show you and I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So there, there's the promise that God makes to him if he will go uh, and uh, will obey. He's promised a number of things. Um, here he is promised a blessing, right? He will be a source of blessing and he himself will be blessed. He is promised nationhood. Now the ironic thing about Abram is that at this point he has no children. Uh, he, uh, his wife is barren. She has never been able to have children. And they are both very old at this point. They are in their 70s when they leave uh, Haran. If you don't have children by the time you're in their seven, your 70s, it's not going to happen, uh, typically, particularly for, for the woman. And she's never been able to have children. So this uh, promise about becoming a nation is uh, ridiculous for Abraham. Uh, how is he going to have children? And yet he's promised that he's going to become a great nation. Later on, he will also be promised land. Now that There are uh, other occasions here, uh, Genesis 15 and then again in, in 17, where God reiterates this covenant and adds to it, specifies things. And among those is land, that he will inherit the land on which he now stands, which or which he's about to stand on, which is uh, in the land of Canaan. So this is, again, origins of the Israelites. It's legitimating their existence and their uh, possession of the land of Canaan. Now, on two other occasions, God... Uh, reiterates this covenant, and again, he adds things to it. So in Genesis 15, there is a covenant ceremony 
uh, God, Abraham uh, sacrifices animals, and God comes down and speaks to him and makes this covenant with him. And here, the occasion is that, again, Abraham had no children, and so he is beginning to doubt whether God will fulfill his promise. And so Abram says, uh, O Lord, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. So he says, at this point, if I were to die right now, I have no heir. Uh, I've got a, I've got a, a guy named Eliezer uh, who seems to be a slave. So he says, a slave born in my house is to be my heir. So he's going to leave his possessions to a slave, not a son. And that's because God has not yet kept his promise. And so God tells Abraham, this man shall not be your heir, but one of your very own issues shall you be your heir. And he brings Abraham outside. He says, look up at the stars in the sky. Look toward heaven and count the stars, if you are able to count them. Then he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And Abraham believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. So, now I had a funny story, side, side note here. Uh, my college roommate told me, he grew up in a city, and uh, one night he, he was uh, out in the country, because I grew up in the country, and he was at my house, actually, and he looked up at the sky, and he was just amazed. He's like, oh, you can see so many stars out here. And he said, you know, when I was a kid, and I read this, I read, uh, you know, where God told Abraham to count the stars. And so I went outside and I counted the stars, as many stars as I could see. And I counted 12 stars. So I thought, oh, that must be the 12 tribes of Israel. He took that very literally. But the point here is that God is telling Abraham, you're going to have countless descendants, too many to number. That's how many descendants you will have. But he's emphasizing here, they will be your descendants. They will come from your own body. So, you have this promise. A couple chapters later, it has to be further clarified. Because now, by this point, Abraham is 99 years old. Or actually, his name is still Abram, but he is 99 years old. And what has happened in the intervening time God promised Abram that he would have descendants. But what about Sarah? Sarah's the problem here, his wife, who can't have children. So they get an idea. They say, well, I've got, uh, Sarah has a handmaiden, a female slave. And it was a uh, common practice for aristocracy, for wealthy people in the ancient Near East. If there was a wealthy woman who could not have children, she could take a female slave who would become a concubine for her husband and would bear children on her behalf and they would legally be considered her children. So they do this. She's got this slave girl named Hagar who has a child with Abraham. That child's name is Ishmael. But uh, So they've tried to solve the problem on their own. Of course, there are... Uh, issues there because uh, Sarah becomes jealous of Hagar. Uh, she's been able to give Abraham what Sarah couldn't. So Sarah, Hagar leaves and then comes back and, and it all gets, uh, but, but there are issues. In chapter 17, so that all happens in 16. In 17, God once again appears to Abraham and this time clarifies that not only Will Abraham have a son? Sarah will have a son. He says, um, he says to, to him, as, this is verse 15, God said to Abram, Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. So her name changes. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. And at this, Abraham falls on his face and laughs and says, Can a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? Can Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? 
and he laughs. And that's the significance of the name of that child who is born is Isaac. Isaac in Hebrew means he laughs, Yitzchak. So, but this is all to test Abraham's faith. Will he believe what God tells him? Now here, there's also something else, two other important things that happen. One, Abraham's name is changed. He has been called Abram up to this point. His name now becomes Abraham. And the, uh, uh, so the significance of that is a status change here. He goes from a Avram means exalted father, Avraham means father of a multitude. So emphasizing again, he's going to have lots of descendants. The second thing is that there's now a, an additional requirement for the covenant. In addition to simply believing and following, uh, now there is a physical sign, it's circumcision. So he establishes the covenant with Abraham. Again, this agreement, covenant being an agreement, a contract between God and Abraham. And in contracts, of course, there's fine print. There are stipulations. There are terms of that contract. Here, the term for Abraham is, you and all your male descendants after you need to be circumcised. And that's going to be the sign of the covenant. And anyone who is not circumcised, he says, will be cut off from the land or cut, cut off from the covenant, will be excluded from the covenant. So this will become very important throughout Jewish history, throughout the Old Testament. It will become an important controversy in the New Testament as Gentiles, non-Jews, become more and more a part of the focus uh, for the mission and for salvation, is do they have to be circumcised as well? But that's, that's in the New Testament. So uh, you've got the covenant here. And the sign of that covenant in Genesis 17 is circumcision. Now, throughout these stories, there's always there's this uh, this struggle against threats to the promise. Um, we've already talked about some of this, right? That the uh, God promises Abraham all these things, but it seems like it can't happen because uh, he's got to have children. Well, he's old, and Sarah is barren. She's never been able to have children. So... How can God possibly keep his promise? It seems impossible. Another theme is what we call the ancestress in danger. There are several instances where uh, either Sarah or uh, Abraham's relationship with Sarah is threatened. So shortly after God initially calls him out of Haran, there's a famine in the land of Canaan, and uh, Abraham and Sarah go down to Egypt and stay there during the famine. And uh, while they are there, Abraham is afraid that the, Isra that the Egyptians will see his beautiful wife. And remember, she's in her 70s at this point. But apparently she's so attractive that they're going to kill him so they can take her. So he, he comes up with this plan that uh, wherever they go, she should tell people she is his sister. And then they will treat her, uh, treat him well because of her, because they want to get on her good side. Well, in Egypt, that means she's taken from Abraham, and she is brought into Pharaoh's court. She's going to be Pharaoh's wife. Well, God sends plagues on the Egyptians, and and the truth comes out, uh, which is interesting because it sort of foreshadows what happens later. Our next next video will be considering the book of Exodus where God also sends plagues on the Egyptians to get his people out. But uh, you know, that's a threat. If she's with Pharaoh, then she can't have Abraham's child. The same thing happens again in Genesis 20. They're in another city, this time a city called Gerar, and they do the exact same thing. So their, their relationship is constantly threatened. Um, Hagar, the other woman, in Genesis 16 and then again in 21, could also be seen as a threat, that they try to fulfill this promise uh, through someone else, and uh, it jeopardizes things as well. Um, she becomes Abraham's concubine, bears a son named Ishmael. So there are all these threats, uh, none of them greater than what we read about in Genesis 22. 
And Genesis 22 is one of the most important stories and probably one of the most disturbing stories in the Old Testament. Uh, it's, it's in Jewish tradition, it's called the Akedah, which means binding. This is the binding of Isaac. And it's, uh, it revolves around uh, a command that God gives Abraham. So remember, Isaac is the child of promise. It's not Ishmael, but a son born to Sarah. It's, it's um, Isaac who is the promise. And by this point, Ishmael has actually been sent away. Um, there were uh, conflicts uh, and, and jealousy, and Ish, uh, Abraham sent away Hagar and Ishmael. So they are out of the picture now. Everything that this covenant stands for is all vested in Isaac. If anything happens to Isaac, uh, the covenant uh, seemingly will be dead. So in Genesis 22, God gives Abraham a very strange and disturbing command. It says, after these things, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I will show you. So kill your son. Offer him as a burnt offering. Commit human sacrifice. Now, throughout the Old Testament, human sacrifice is very consistently condemned. Uh, there are many laws against this, and specifically the sacrificing of one's children. This is a specific command that you shall not cause your son or daughter to pass through the fire, which is another way of saying don't offer them as sacrifices. Now, it does happen sometimes, but it's strongly condemned in the Old Testament, except here where God actually commands it, which is strange. Why would God command something? that God later on uh, gives explicit commands against doing. But this is the command. Offer Isaac as a sacrifice. And so it says, So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and set out and went to the place in the distance that God had showed him. Now, it... Why is there no dialogue? There's no debate here. Abraham doesn't argue back with God. Um, he doesn't protest. He doesn't bargain. He just he gets, gets up and follows instructions, uh, which I think is very, very interesting here, why Abraham doesn't argue with God. Uh, and, and it's interesting to think about that in light of Abraham's behavior up to this point. We've seen that Abraham sometimes doubts God with uh, protecting Sarah, um, with giving him a son. And so Ishmael is born because of Abraham taking matters into his own hands, not simply trusting in God. Um, we skipped over this, but in the, there's an interesting story in uh, Genesis 18 and 19. This is the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham has a nephew named Lot, who lives in Sodom. And when God informs Abraham that he's going to destroy the city of Sodom, Abraham bargains with God. He says, surely you won't sweep away the righteous and the wicked. You wouldn't do that. You wouldn't destroy righteous people. Because he knows he's got his nephew who lives there, and apparently he believes his nephew is a good guy. He says, God won't destroy innocent people along with the wicked. So he bargains with God. He says, well, what if there are 50 righteous people? Will you spare the city for 50 righteous? And God says, yeah, I'll, I'll spare the city for 50 righteous. And then he, he works him all the way down. He says, well, what if there aren't what if there aren't 50? What if there are only 40? And he works him all the way down to 10. If there are 10 righteous people, he'll spare the city. And then Abraham stops. Now, why does he stop there? The text doesn't really say. It may be that Abraham doesn't believe that God would possibly spare the city for more than or for fewer than 10. That's the bare minimum that would be reasonable. 
and so he doesn't push his luck any further, but we don't know for sure. But notice he doesn't do that here. He's no bargaining, no negotiation, no arguing. He just obeys. And as they're walking along, on the third day, Abraham sees the place where they're to go. He leaves the servants behind, and he and Isaac walk on up the mountain on their own. Now, Isaac, the, the word that's used here to describe him, he don't imagine like a six- or seven-year-old child. Uh, the Hebrew has different words for young children and older children. He is not called a tinoke, which is like a toddler or a baby, nor is he called a yelled, which is a child. He's called a na'ar. And na'ar means uh, young, like lad, like a, like a teenager or even a young adult. He could potentially have been in his 20s at this point, but at the very least he is, uh, I would say, a teenager. And Abraham is well over a hundred at this point. So, if Isaac doesn't cooperate, Isaac can probably take Abraham physically. Uh, he's not going to be able to force him. So Isaac begins to ask questions. He says, hey, I see we've got the fire and the wood and the knife, but where's the lamb? And, uh, and Abraham says, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering. And so they go on. And they get up to the place of sacrifice, and Abraham ties up, he binds Isaac, hence the name, binding of Isaac, lays him on the altar, takes the knife, and he's about to kill his son. Now again, Isaac has to be cooperating or he would have gotten away. So this is a test maybe for both of them. And suddenly there comes a voice from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And he looks over and he sees a ram with its horns caught in a thorn bush, and he offers that as a sacrifice instead. So what he had told Isaac was correct. God did provide a sacrifice. Does he know that that's going to happen when he says it, though? So this is a kind of, It's a great story because it's so open to interpretation. Is Abraham lying to Isaac? Is he? Is this really a statement of faith? Does he really believe that God will not make him do this? Here's how I read it. I th I bring this back into dialogue with Genesis 18, where Abraham had bargained with God, and I think that the difference here is that Abraham has learned something about this God, because in Genesis 18 and 19, remember I Abraham had asked for, if there are ten, will you spare the city for ten? If you continue on into 19, there were not 10 righteous people. The city was destroyed. Um, and I, Abraham knows that because he wakes up the next day and he looks out and he sees the smoldering heap that used to be Sodom. But something that Abraham never asked for and I think didn't expect happened. God saved his nephew Lot. He didn't save the whole city. There were not ten righteous people. The city was destroyed. But God did something that Abraham never asked for and maybe he never expected, and that was he saved the one. Abraham never asked, what if there's only one? So it's actually, it's, it's Lot and his two daughters are saved. He never asked, will you save Lot? But maybe now, if not, if not Abraham, at least the reader at this point has learned something about this God, that the answer to Abraham's question Will God destroy the righteous with the wicked? The answer is no. God didn't destroy the righteous with the wicked. And so if you carry that with you here into Genesis 22, you have to know, you have to expect, God is not going to allow Isaac to die. This is a God who is faithful to his covenant. This is a God who does not destroy wicked or innocent people with wicked people. So he will surely spare Isaac. It's a lesson in, not so much in, is Abraham willing to give up his son as much as, how much does Abraham trust this God? Does he believe that this God will keep his promise no matter what? Because remember, if Isaac dies, the covenant dies with him. And so he passes the test here. 
Isaac goes on to not really do a whole lot. He's not nearly as active a character as Abraham. He marries his cousin, Rebecca, uh, from Haran. So they, the ancestors are always going, they go, remember they, uh, Abraham's family stopped in Haran. He has a brother who lives there. And they maintain contact with them. So they are always going back and forth. And in particular, they marry uh, they find their wives back in Haran. All the all the wives come from there, so they marry cousins. He marries his cousin Rebecca, uh, and uh, settles down to a quiet life in the vicinity of Beersheba. Um, is an interesting story in Genesis 26 where he does the exact same thing that Abraham had done: tries to pass off his wife as his sister. And interestingly, here it's in the same city. And the guy he does it to has the same name, Abimelech of Gerar. It may have been the son of the earlier Abimelech, or maybe this is more of a title. Abimelech means my, my father is king. So, uh, But he does the exact same thing there. Now, Isaac's main accomplishment actually is his children. He has two sons, twin sons named Jacob and Esau. And Jacob and Esau are as different as night and day. We meet them in Genesis 25. So Isaac's wife, Rebecca, is pregnant. And she is pregnant with twins. And the children are fighting. They're kicking each other inside her. And she asks a question. She says, if it is to be this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and there's a prophecy. God tells her, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided. The, old, the one shall be stronger than the other, the elder shall serve the younger. So these two sons, these two children that are inside her, will become two nations. So it's more than just uh, Isaac and, uh, and, and uh, you know, there's going to be multiple nations born from Abraham. And so these two are Jacob and Esau. Jacob is the ancestor of the Israelites. Esau is the ancestor of the Edomites, who were a, another group of people who lived just south and a little bit east of Israel, the Edomites, so the country of Edom. They are his descendants. And so when she gives birth, the two children come out, and the first comes out all red, and his body is hairy like a mantle, so they named him Esau. Esau means red. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand gripping Esau's heel. So he's got a hold of Esau's foot. And so they named him Jacob, Yaakov, which means heel grabber someone who is a usurper, someone who grabs people and pulls them back and takes their place. And these, this name is, is sort of prophetic for him because this is also what his character will be like. He is someone who gets ahead at the expense of other people. So he's very, very competitive. We see this later on as they grow up. It says, when the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man living in tents. E Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. So they have very different personalities. Now as, these, uh, as the children, uh, Esau and Jacob, grow up, their, uh, their character begins to manifest itself in different ways. So there are a couple interesting stories about them. First is that... Uh, Again, remembering that Esau is the outdoorsy guy. He's very masculine. He's a hunter. Uh, and he's also very, very hairy. Uh, and, uh, and that Jacob is um, everything Esau is not. He's quiet. He's an indoorsy guy. And that the parents have their favorites. Right? Esau likes, or Isaac likes Esau. And uh, Rebecca likes Jacob. And so one day, uh, Esau has been out hunting, and he comes in, and he's all tired and hot, and Jacob is cooking. And Esau says to Jacob, hey, give me some of that red stuff. 
which makes him sound very crude, right? He doesn't even know what it is. He just, oh, that red stuff. Me want red stuff. And he uh, says, I'm hungry. I'm starving to death. And so Jacob says, well, hey, sell me your birthright. Now, birthright, this is a legal issue. Uh, the birthright is the right of the firstborn. Uh, it means, this is, a, this is a legal status, it has to do with inheritance. That when Isaac dies, uh, Esau, by virtue of being the firstborn son, will inherit twice as much uh, property as Jacob will. And he will become the legal patriarch of the family. What Jacob is requesting here is, you trade me that for a pot of stew. Now, uh, you don't need to be a master negotiator, a negotiator to realize that that's a very bad deal. You know, double the inheritance versus a uh, single pot of stew. Very, very bad deal. Esau takes the deal. Uh, Esau says, I am about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? So, is Jacob wrong here? Well, he's certainly not being very nice. He uh, is, uh, this is, you know, not brotherly, you know, love. But uh, Esau is being very short-sighted here. He's only thinking of his needs in the moment. And so one, one thing to consider here with Jacob is we're going to see that God prospers Jacob, even though Jacob really isn't a very nice guy. Uh, he's a trickster. He is a, um, he's a manipulator. He's a deceiver. And yet God chooses him and prospers him. And so does that mean God endorses Jacob's behavior? Well, I have a good friend, actually, who would argue yes. Uh, he wrote his dissertation. He's written a book on Jacob and on God as tricksters, that God is complicit in Jacob's deception and trickery. Um, on the other hand, you could say that, well, there may be reasons for that, that maybe God sees in Jacob certain qualities that, while, uh, you know, maybe they need to be uh, modified a bit, Jacob has some character flaws, he also has some qualities that would make him a good choice. Esau is not the brightest. He's not the sharpest tool in the shed. And he doesn't think about the future. He neglect. he spurns things. Right? It says, actually, Esau despised his birthright. He did not recognize. He didn't grasp its value. So he's maybe not the best person to entrust the covenant to. Jacob, on the other hand, while he has some, some moral failures, uh, he at least thinks about the future. He is uh, uh, ambitious and maybe has survival instincts that will serve him well, and intelligence that will serve him well. So Jacob gets the, the birthright. There is something else, though, and this is called the blessing. These are two different things. The, the uh, birthright is legal. The blessing is spiritual. The blessing is the covenant. Who gets to be the heir of the covenant? And so in uh, chapter 27, in Genesis 27, Isaac is old, he's about to die, and he summons Esau to him and says, I'm going to bless you before I die. But I want you to go out and hunt me some game and make and prepare it the way I like it and come in here and I'll eat. And before I die, I will uh, pronounce this blessing over you. So Esau goes out to hunt. Now, Rebekah had overheard. And notice it's Rebekah here. It's not Jacob. Rebekah, his mother, overheard. And of course, Jacob is her favorite. So she comes to Jacob and says, hey, your father's going to bless Isaac, or he's going he's to bless Esau. So here's what you need to do. Um, you need to go in and deceive your father. Uh, bring me some game and prepare me, uh, and we'll prepare this. And um, you take it to your father so that he may eat, uh, and so that he may bless you before he dies. 
Jacob, of course, sees some problems with this plan. He says "I uh, that um, Esau is hairy and I'm not. What if he? What if my father touches me? And he'll know that I'm not Esau, and he'll actually pronounce a curse on me rather than a blessing. And uh, his mother says, "Well, you you let the curse be on me. I'll take care of it." So she goes and she she takes some skins from goats, some goat skin, and she binds it onto Jacob's arms and on his neck, so that if his father touches him, he'll feel this goat skin with its fur, which should tell us something about how just how hairy Esau was. And uh, so he, he does that, and he goes in, and he deceives his father. And his father actually is suspicious. He says, you don't sound like Esau. You sound like Jacob. But he reaches out and touches him. And he says, okay, maybe I'm just going crazy here. So he pronounces the blessing over Jacob. And no sooner has he left than Esau comes in. And suddenly they realize what has happened. And uh, Esau is very upset. Asks for a, do you, do you have another blessing? He says, well, yeah, but it's not, it's not as good. You're going to be a servant to your brother. He will be blessed. This can't be taken back. And so uh, I, Esau is furious um, at what his, father, what his uh, brother had done, that he used trickery and deception here. So his plot is, once my father dies, I'm going to kill Jacob. So Jacob leaves. He flees to Haran, again, this place where they have family. Goes and stays with his wife's brother, uh, a guy named Laban. So this is his uncle. And it's there that uh, his life becomes very, very interesting. He meets his wife, uh, well, two of them actually. Uh, he meets a woman named Rachel. This is his cousin. And he meets her one day and he falls instantly in love with her, wants to marry her, and so he requests her hand in marriage from his uncle Laban. Now Laban, we know where Jacob gets his trickery. It comes from his mother's side. Remember, it was her idea to trick Isaac. And his, her brother, Laban, is exactly the same way, just like Jacob. And this mirrors what happened with Jacob and Esau. Remember when Jacob, uh, when Esau wanted the stew and Jacob said, okay, but it's going to cost you. Same thing happens to Jacob now. So he, he, gets, he gets what he deserves. Is that when he asks for... Rachel's hand in marriage, Laban sees an opportunity and says, okay, what's going to cost you? You're going to have to work for me for seven years before you can marry Rachel. But Jacob does it. He said, in fact, it's like felt like seven days because he loved her so much. So when seven days is up, wedding day comes and uh, wedding night comes. And apparently she was wearing a very thick veil because uh, it's... And, Apparently it was very dark in that room too because the next morning, it's not until the next morning, he looks over and he realizes this is not Rachel. She had a sister named Leah, his older, her older sister, and he gets tricked. So here's the parallel to Jacob's trickery of Esau. Just as he had deceived his father to impersonate his brother, now there's impersonation. And he marries the wrong sister and doesn't realize it until the next day. So he comes to Laban and he's very upset. So, well, you tricked me. And Laban's excuse is, well, we have a custom that the younger daughter can't get married until the older daughter does. So you can have Rachel too, but it's going to cost you another seven years. So he ends up working 14 years, ends up with two wives instead of one. And uh, he marries two sisters, which is never a good idea. Uh, because sibling rivalry. But you see here that, that the things he did to Esau come back to him. So there is some justice here, that exactly the same things that happened to him, uh, that, that he had done, now happened to him. Well, uh, he because he and Jacob, uh, he, he and Laban are so much alike, they have a lot of conflict. Eventually, uh, Jacob ends up leaving, and he goes back to Canaan. Now, his father's dead. And as far as he knows, uh, Esau still wants to kill him. So he's very afraid of what will happen. 
And being the brave soul that he is, as he's approaching Canaan, he sends a bunch of presents ahead to Jacob. He sends all of his slaves and all of his possessions ahead. And then finally, the last thing, he sends his wives and children ahead of him. He is creating a huge buffer, a shield, so that they'll all get killed before he does. He's a great, upstanding guy. And he is the last one left, because he doesn't know what's going to happen. And that night, before he crosses over to meet his brother, and possibly his death, a man appears and wrestles with Jacob all night long. And by the end of the story, you, you come to find out that this is not an ordinary man. This is maybe an angel, perhaps God himself, we'll just call him a divine being. And Jacob wrestles with him all night long, and no, neither one of them can win. They're sort of at a stalemate. And uh, and Jacob, well, the, the man reaches out and touches Jacob on the, the hip and disables him. <clears throat> and so uh, the fight ends, and Jacob says, I won't let you go until you bless me. And the man says, well, what is your name? He said, Jacob. Then the man said, You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Understanding the name Israel to mean one who struggles with God, one who contends with God. And so his name is changed here to Israel, which, of course, becomes the name of the nation that is descended from him. And Jacob finds out that this was a divine being because he asks, What is your name? And he says, uh, why do you ask my name? And he blesses Jacob. And Jacob ends up naming the place Peniel, which means face of God. He says, I have seen God face to face and have lived. So his name is changed to Israel. And that's important because between these two wives, he has a total of 13 children. He has two, uh, two, uh, he, has, he has one, uh, one uh, daughter, uh, and then he has a total of 12 sons. Six of them are born to Leah. She is much, has a lot more children. And in fact, she has a bunch of children. And Rachel uh, has the family curse of uh, sterility. She can't. She has trouble having children. She does eventually have children. But before then, she pulls a, you know, a Hagar kind of move, gives her maid, her slave, Bilhah, to Jacob, and so he has two children with Bilhah. And then Leah has had trouble keeping up, so she does the same thing. So her her slave Zilpah is given to Jacob, and he has two children with her. So now he's got four women, Leah, Bilhah, Zilpah, and Rachel. Leah has six children, Bilhah has two, Zilpah has two, and Rachel has two. Rachel's two are the most important. They are Joseph and Benjamin. They are also among the youngest. Benjamin is the youngest. Rachel dies giving birth to Benjamin. But because these are the children of Rachel, which was uh, Jacob's favorite wife, of course these children are his favorites as well. So he loves them more. That leads to problems uh, because he shows such overt favoritism in particular for Joseph. But these 12 become the 12 tribes of Israel. And so they are, um, each of them stands at the head of one of these tribes. And in fact, Joseph gets two, Ephraim and Manasseh. So in a sense, there are actually 13 tribes. His gets split into two. He gets the double portion because he was the favorite. Uh, but these are the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, I mentioned at the beginning the Joseph story. Uh, Joseph is a, uh, sometimes you could consider him one of the ancestors as well. Now, he's only really the ancestor of two tribes, of Ephraim and Manasseh. But his story here is a long story that is all unified together, and it's very important in the book of Genesis, uh, the story of Joseph. So in a nutshell, there's a, there's a PowerPoint here, a slide that lays out 
this story, but really you just need to read it uh, because it's such a unified story. But in a nutshell, here are the high points. So Joseph, again, is Jacob's favorite. Jacob gives him all kinds of presents. He gives, you know, the coat of many colors that he is famous for. Um, and because of this, his brothers hate him because he's the obvious favorite. So there's all kinds of sibling rivalry. Joseph also is a dreamer. Like he literally, he has dreams. And these dreams are revelatory. They're, they're symbolic. They predict the future. So he has a couple dreams. He dreams about um, sheaves of, of grain, his and his 11 brothers, and that their sheaves of grain all bow down to his. He has another dream where the sun, moon, and 11 stars all bow down to him. Now, it doesn't take a genius to figure out what these dreams mean. They signify his, his sense of superiority, that he believes that his whole family is going to bow down to him someday. As you can imagine, his brothers do not appreciate this. So one day when he is journeying out to meet them in the field, they get the idea they're going to, they're, they're going to do something about it. First, they want to kill him. They, they, they catch him, they throw him down in a, in a pit, and their plan originally is to kill him. But, but one of the brothers, Reuben, negotiates, uh, let's not kill him, let's sell him into slavery. Uh, and so uh, they, uh, actually I think it was, it was Judah who came up with that, but they, Reuben doesn't want to kill him. Uh, the Judah says, let's sell him into slavery. So there are uh, slave traders who come by and they sell Joseph. And he is taken down to Egypt and sold as a slave to a man named Potiphar. So he's working in the house of Potiphar. And he ga gains Potiphar's trust. He becomes actually the head of Potiphar's household. He takes care of everything. Second in command. Prospering. Until one day, uh, Potiphar's wife... Uh, makes a move on Joseph. She she likes Joseph, and so uh, she she makes an offer, and J uh, Joseph uh, turns her down. Uh, she wants to get even because he has spurned her. So she accuses him of uh, of it was the other way around that he tried to uh, to come on to her. He, he tried to rape her, and so uh, and in fact she like grabs a hold of his garment and he runs and it rips off of him so he's running around naked and she's holding his clothing which looks very very bad for him it's very incriminating and tells her husband what happened or what she says happened and so joseph ends up thrown into prison in prison he meets some important people he meets the uh chief uh cup bearer of the king and the chief baker of the king and they are thrown in prison because apparently someone tried to poison the king and these are the two suspects because he eats and drinks the things that they handle. So pending investigation to find out who actually did it, they're both in prison. Both of them have dreams. And Joseph is able to interpret their dreams for them. Their dreams are symbolic. And they uh, represent that one of them, is the cupbearer, will be restored to his position. And it comes to pass. The other one, the baker, will be executed. So he's found guilty and he's killed. And just before the cupbearer goes back to Pharaoh's court, Joseph asks him, can you remember me? Can you get me out of here? I'm falsely imprisoned. And the cupbearer forgets all about that. He goes back to his life. But then one day, the Pharaoh has dreams. And they're troubling. They're symbolic dreams. And none of the dream interpreters of the Pharaoh can interpret them for him. So, suddenly the cupbearer remembers Joseph, that he could interpret dreams. So Joseph is brought out of prison, and he interprets Pharaoh's dreams. And they represent this, these dreams that there were seven healthy cows, fat cows, that came out of the Nile River. And then after them came seven scrawny cows, and they ate the healthy cows and were still scrawny. And then... Seven healthy grains of, uh, 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 you know, stalks of grain grow up. And then after them, seven wind-blown and, and bad, you know, uh, uh, unhealthy ears of grain grow. And they somehow eat. I don't know how grain eats, but it eats the healthy grain and is still 
just as lean. Joseph interprets these dreams. He says what it means is that there will be seven years of plenty in the land, followed by seven years of famine. And then he advises the Pharaoh, here's what you need to do to survive. During the seven years of plenty, build storehouses and save up all the extra grain so that you can survive the seven years of famine. Pharaoh thinks, that's a great idea. Why don't you do it? So Joseph is released from prison, and he actually is put in charge of this project, and he is elevated to the position of second in command of all of Egypt. So he's the second most important person after Pharaoh. The famine comes. Joseph's brothers come down to Egypt to buy grain because the famine is bad everywhere. So they come down there to buy grain. Joseph recognizes them. They do not recognize him. For all they know, he's dead. And he has some fun with them. He, he uh, accuses them of being spies. He takes one of them prisoner, says they have to go back home and they have to bring back their youngest brother, Benjamin. Or he won't, he'll kill the other one. Or he'll keep the other one in prison. So eventually they come back with Benjamin. And Joseph has fun with them again. He accuses Benjamin this time of uh, stealing and is going to have him, uh, you know, arrested. Uh, but uh, uh, eventually he reveals himself to his brothers and says, I am Joseph. And uh, they, uh, the whole family comes down and moves to Egypt, including their father, Jacob. So they all, they all settle in the land. Jacob dies there, eventually Joseph dies, and all of the Israelites are living in Egypt, in the land of Goshen, which is the Nile Delta region. Now, what's the significance of this story? Well, the Joseph story is important for a number of reasons. One, it's in a very inspiring moral story. This is a genre we call court tales. There are several of these. The book of Daniel has some court tales, the book of Esther... And they are meant to instruct on how to live faithfully in a hostile environment, in a foreign, a pagan land. How does, how does Jews, how do they live faithfully to God? And Joseph is a great example. You know, he's morally upright. He doesn't compromise. Um, you know, he resists temptation. So it's important for that reason as I just sort of, you know, behave this way as an example. But more importantly, is the literary significance of this story. It is a prelude to the Exodus. It explains how the Israelites come to live in the land of Egypt. It connects the book of Genesis with the book of Exodus. Because if you did not have this story, you would not understand why suddenly the Israelites are slaves in Egypt. This explains how they end up there. That they come to... Uh, Egypt because of the famine, and they settle there, and then they just stay. Uh, but things go, go badly for them eventually, but only after there's a dynasty change where the pharaoh who was there when, uh, when Joseph came in dies, and the, uh, you know, the, the well treatment of the Israelites comes to an end. But this is important because it's a literary bridge between those two uh, blocks of tradition. So it's important in that sense. Uh, and that's the ancestral narrative. So uh, really what I'm looking for, uh, as far as what you would know about this for tests and quizzes and so forth, is make sure you understand, um, you know, those four generations, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, and the transmission of the covenant, you know, that it goes from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob and then his 12 sons are the ancestors. Uh, you'll want to know some details, uh, you know, especially about the, the Akedah and the story of Joseph uh, and the, uh, the you know, conflict between Esau and Jacob. Uh, but the main thing here is to know uh, what these stories are, you know, a big picture and, and the role of the covenant in them.